The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. Did you know that over 95% of all businesses fail within the first 10 years? By listening in to what Bob's guests have to say, plus direction from Bob Pritchard himself, it's our intention that you won't be among those statistics. Now, here's your host, Bob Pritchard. Hello, world. Welcome to the first Bob Pritchard Radio Show for 2015. The weather number one global business radio show for entrepreneurs, and we're going to be bigger and better this year. Today, we're bringing in the show live from the Intercontinental Hotel in the heart of Sao Paulo in Brazil. This year, I'll be bringing you a number of shows from overseas, from various countries around the world, so I hope you enjoy your travels. Now, as you know, this program is all about helping entrepreneurs to be successful, (laughs) And I believe that this year is going to be a fantastic year for business, but especially for entrepreneurs. So if you're thinking about starting a business, this is obviously the right time. We will continue to bring you advice and great interviews throughout the year that will help you to maximize the success in your business. We've already lined up 15 terrific interviews to bring you, and we'll also continue to give you the latest in business news and in practical advice that can help you build your business. Now, in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to be wired just a little differently than most people. Most people don't like the uncertainty of not knowing where the next dollar is coming from and battling to try and build a business without any security. Most probably, you've been called a dreamer your whole life. When you were at school, people used to say to you, you're a dreamer. You know, get get your feet on reality. I know my mum used to tell me that I needed to have my feet on the ground. And you've probably told yourself that a few times as well. However, saying that you're a dreamer or a doer, which is the opposite, is like saying that you're good or bad. To be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to be both. Nobody's 100% one way or the other, but you may lean more in one direction. You know, you may be a lot of dreamer and a little bit of doer. It's a spectrum. And the good news is that you can shift the paradigm so that you can have the right balance of both. You know, often people that are regarded as doers are considered to be destined to succeed. But being a doer isn't necessarily better than being a dreamer. You can be a doer and just work for wages your whole life with no great dreams. But if you're really off kilter and spend the day dreaming and not actually ever doing anything, then you're going to have a problem. So it's time to take action. Let let me just give you some of the easiest and quickest ways to embrace your inner doer so that the dreamer in you can actually get things done. Remember, without a comprehensive, balanced approach, you're just going to keep going round and round and round in circles. So if you want to make your idea a reality, you want to set up a company, you want to solicit manufacturing, you want to set up distribution and have your own business, that's fantastic, brilliant. But just how far along are you? Have you thought through the various elements that you have to have in place? Have you determined the company's structure? Have you developed a business plan and formulated budgets? Do you understand how much money you're going to need to make your dream a reality? How are you going to go about obtaining the financing? Perhaps you can bootstrap it, but most people can't. And make no, no, you know, don't be under any illusions. Building a business is damned hard work. 
And a lot of people aren't prepared to that work. They want to dream the dream. They want to be on the yachts and the Lamborghinis, but they don't actually want to do the work. You know, dreaming's good fun and it's easy. You make your dream a reality. You can enjoy all these wonderful things into your dream. But making it successful and actually earning the money takes a lot of thought, a lot of research, and a hell of a lot of planning. So depending on where you are with your plans, you should create a list of all the things you need to do and then set deadlines to get each of them done. You can do this on a week-to-week basis or a month-to-month basis. It doesn't matter. But this approach works for any goal, not just building a business. Secondly, you need to build the balance between wants and needs. Every time you decide you want something, follow that decision up with a list of steps you need to take to make it happen. This might mean, um, let's think, saving a certain amount of money for a special activity like setting up the company structure or maybe registering your IP. And if you want to save $20,000 in one year, for example, look at your budget and figure out how much you need to save each and every week to make that happen. Perhaps you need to make cuts in your expenditure. You might also need to pick up more hours at work, maybe get a second job. It just depends on how much you really need your dream. You know, most people, for example, you know, they don't realize how expensive it is to run a car. So maybe you need to sell your car and use one of the ride share services instead, like Uber. It's fantastic. It's a damn sight cheaper than having a car. And that could save you thousands of dollars a year. And the sale of your car might give you some cash to put towards your startup. Thirdly, you need to surround yourself with doers. One or two dreamers is enough. The rest need to be doers. So who are your five best friends? Now, dreamers love to associate with dreamers and they feed off each other. But you'll find that if you're around doers, they're going to inspire you. They're going to inspire you to get stuff done. And, you know, the the really staunch doers, they're not very quick to indulge your dreamer tendencies. And they want to know what your plan is. Remember, you're in charge of your support network. I've always surrounded myself with um, a number of mentors and advisors that have the know-how and the experience that I lack. It enables me to get the best advice possible on a consistent basis. That's amazing how many mistakes I've avoided just by getting seasoned advice from people who have become friends. And when I'm on a project, I'm not at all precious about what I do. I'm I'm more than happy to take on board all forms of advice. I'll change my opinion instantly if that advice is good and compelling I advise anybody that's embarking on something that's new to them to get outside expert advice. Fourthly, don't do stuff that doesn't work. You know the definition of insanity. I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times. Doing something repeatedly and hoping that you're going to get a different result is insanity. You know it isn't going to happen. So why do you get stuck in that rut? I know so many people have tried and tried and tried and tried and it always fails and yet they keep trying. So if you've been dreaming about something but you, you know these attempts haven't led to any positive results, it's time to stop, reassess, figure out what's wrong and try a fresh approach. You'll never get anywhere making the same mistakes over and over again. You've heard the term pivot. Nearly every major company's pivoted. That means they've gone from one direction to another because they've found that what they're doing isn't working. Finally, in order to achieve success, you need to assume everything will take twice as long and cost three times as much. I know people who say it's going to take me three months and it's going to cost $10,000 and they find that it takes a year and it costs $50,000. Well, if you're that far out, you're going to be in trouble because you're going to run out of money. You know, one of the downsides of being a dreamer is that it's easy to think of everything being really easy in the dreaming stage. Everything just falls into place and it happens. The reality is, It just doesn't work like that. Things have a tendency to take much, much, much more money and time than you imagine, particularly if you haven't done your homework 
and created a good plan. So when developing your action plan, increase the estimate of the time required to achieve a result and also increase the amount of money that it's going to cost you and increase it by about 20% or 25%. Give yourself a buffer. The worst case scenario is that you'll succeed with time and money left over. So now you're a doer, but don't let your drive to be a doer diminish your dreaming. You've got to continue to dream. Dream that big dream. It's your source of your ideas. It's your inspiration. It's your creativity. And it's the way you'll achieve success. So I urge everybody to become an entrepreneur. If you think you've got the skills for it and you've got an idea that you think will make people's life easier, go for it. And there's no better time than this year when the economy's on the up. Everything's looking great. I've got a question. How many of you have used Instacart? You know, that's a startup that does your grocery shopping. I love it. That simple idea is now worth two billion dollars. All they do is provide groceries with same-day delivery for a slightly higher price for per food item. I mean, it's simple. They just raised two hundred and twenty million at a two billion valuation. So they generated about a hundred million dollars in two thousand and fourteen after raising uh, after generating only about ten million in two thousand and thirteen. So people obviously want other people to do their grocery shopping for them. I'm one. So they, you know, they've got competition. There's Fresh Direct. And Fresh Direct um, has its own store that holds inventory, where Instacart relies on local grocers to fulfill orders. And it's got deals with all the major chains like A&P and Costco and all of those. And uh, they have people who go to your local store for you. But the shoppers don't know what's in stock in advance. When the shoppers go to the shops, they don't know what's there. So a common complaint is that Instacart users spend too much time on the phone with Instacart shoppers discussing replacements for out-of-stock items and new items. And a lot of times you feel like it would be less of a headache to just go and do the shopping yourself. However, on-demand grocery shopping is just one of the major Deliver It Now services that has just exploded this year. Uber led the on-demand service with a $40 billion valuation, and Uber's phenomenal. Postmates is a similar service for delivering packages. So there's no question 2015 is going to be the year of almost instant gratification from a delivery viewpoint, and it's also going to be the year where the shared economy really hits its straps. I love the idea of a shared economy. And I gave the example a couple of weeks ago. There's 90 million electric drills in America. 90 million electric drills. And the average electric drill has been used for only about five minutes. So why would you go out and buy another one when you're only going to probably use it for five minutes? You're better off using one that somebody else has already bought, pay them a couple of bucks, give it back to them when you've done your five minutes worth. I and mean, that's very, very simple philosophy, and it's it's great for the economy. I mentioned earlier that um, 2015 is going to be a fantastic year for startups. London startups have reported raising significantly more venture capital this year than last year, with a new study claiming that money raised in 2014 is double that in 2013. They raised $1.4 billion in venture capital in 2014. So that's a lot of money, and it's 20 times the amount of VC money that was raised by London tech startups just four years ago. But things get a lot less impressive when you compare London to the rest of the world. Silicon Valley tech startups raised over $22 billion in 2014, and New York managed $1.7 billion in just the third quarter of 2014. So money is pouring in to venture capital. And that's because a hell of a lot of people have made a hell of a lot of money out of venture capital over the last few years. Now, London makes up 65% of the UK's total. 
in Los Angeles. The Silicon Beach Entrepreneur Hub is also undergoing huge growth, not only in the number of startups, but in the funds invested. It's big everywhere. And like I said, 2015, huge year for entrepreneurs. So if you're dreaming about it, now is the time to get off your ass and actually do it. Now, you're listening to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show on Voice America Business. Our sole purpose is to assist entrepreneurs to become successful. So if you've got a question about any aspect of business, please don't hesitate to email me at bob at bobpritchard.com. That's bob at bobpritchard.com. We get stacks of emails, so we'll answer it on air or we'll email you directly. Make sure you subscribe to my monthly newsletter. It's sent out to over 16,000 business executives in over 60 countries every month. So make sure you're among them. The next first newsletter for 2015 will be going out in about 10 days. Now, you're listening to Voice America Business, and I'll be back after this break with my friend Darren Danborough. Darren was born in London, now lives in L.A., He's an actor, a producer, director, and a serial entrepreneur. He's appeared in award-winning feature films, commercials, and TV shows, including the huge British hit EastEnders, the US cult show True Blood, as well as one of my favourites, Two Broke Girls, which is fantastic. I don't know how they get away with that shit, but they do. So as an entrepreneur, Darren's founded and co-founded Various business, lots of them have been successful. He's um, he was um, previously on the advisory board of the Bel Air Film Festival. He's the U.S. ambassador of the Global Party, and currently the gala committee of Sir Richard Branson's Rock the Casbah. He's in everything, and he's got a great um, HR business, both in England and in the United States. So this is Bob Pritchard, live from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I'll be back with Darren in just a moment. Do you want your business to achieve results you never thought possible? Bob Pritchard is recognized as the business leader's advisor and has 30 years of experience as a straight-talking troubleshooter for Fortune 500 companies and SMEs across the world. Whether you need a checkup across all departments of your business or simply want to improve marketing, advertising, performance measurement, or some other area, Bob Pritchard will work his magic so you can blow away your competition. Bob Pritchard is also one of the most in-demand speakers in the world. Over 1,500 clients on five continents and countless standing ovations are a testament to how he changes the fortunes of business. Pick up Bob's new book, Kick-Ass Business and Marketing Secrets, at your nearest bookstore or visit Bob's website at www.bobpritchard.com. Remember, if you want to be successful, call Bob Pritchard now. Worldwide phone numbers and more information can be found at bobpritchard.com. Voice America Business Network, the bottom line in business. You are listening to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. To connect with Bob, please send an email to bob at bobpritchard.com. That's bob at bobpritchard.com. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. Now, this is the segment of the show where we talk to people who are, you know, getting off their asses and doing stuff. People that are doing things that can and we can that we can learn from and can help the majority of entrepreneurs to be more successful. Now, this segment's not just about allowing our guests to promote what they've got going on, but of course that's part of it. But we try to ask them questions that. Um, will give us answers that are benefit to all of us. You know, being successful in business is very difficult and very few people really make it. And so we try to find out what it is that's made these people stand out from the rest. What makes them tick? What's made them successful? And what we can take away from their experience that'll make our journey more successful. 
So we're about saluting and helping entrepreneurs no matter what their endeavours. So we can emulate these people who are more successful, then we all win. Now, Darren Darnbury is a great guy and um, is born in London, as you'll find out when we speak to him in a second. He now lives in LA and uh, he belongs to a group that I belong to called Metal, which we talk about frequently. He's an entrepreneur. He's a very creative guy. He's a great actor. And uh, he despises routine. He's a bloody good bloke, apart from all that. He's got extensive experience as an actor. He's appeared in award-winning feature films, commercials, TV shows, including the huge British hit, EastEnders, uh, the US cult show, True Blood, as well as my favourite, Two Broke Girls. I love it. Two Broke Girls. I don't know how they get away with the shit they get away with, but it is fantastic. Um, He's also a writer-producer and made his directorial debut in 2013 with the film Stefano Formaggio. As an entrepreneur, he's founded and co-founded various businesses, including event concepts at Earl's Court, Sundance, Khan in Hollywood, fashion label Corsellus. He, he's, he's all over the place, this guy. He's fantastic. He's got a whole bunch of stuff going. He was named in the 2010 Who's Who of Business, Britain's Business Elite. That sounds like it should be... You know, Britain's business elite sounds pretty pretentious, but this guy's not at all pretentious. He regularly speaks on business and marketing panels. He served on the advisory board of the Bel Air Film Festival. Sounds like another pretentious gig. <laughs> but um, he's currently on the gala committee of Sir Richard Branson's Rock the Casbah, the Brit Week committee and the advisory board of Face Forward. So you, you get the idea that this guy's somebody, right? And... Uh, He's a good bloke. Here he is. Hi, Darren. Great to speak to you again. Hi, Bob. How's it going? It made us really good. The last time I saw you, I can't remember whether it was when we had lunch at, um, let me think. Marmalade. 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 That's right. Or was it the premiere of your movie 20 Foot Below? I I really really loved it. It would have been the same week, I think. Yeah, (laughs) probably. It may may have been. how did that movie go? Actually, it was it was. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was really unique and it was excellent. How'd it go? Thanks very much. Yeah, it went well. We um, we did the premiere that week and yep. uh, we got US distribution, which happened a week after that. So it was available everywhere. You know, from the VOD channels to Netflix to in the stores, in Walmart, you know, Redbox, all of that. We right. we debuted quite high in Redbox, which was good. They put us on the front page. Um, and then um, we released it in the UK, where I think it actually did a little bit better than the US, because they changed the name uh, in the UK and gave it a, a darker, grittier look in the poster. Yeah. And I think that made a lot, a lot of difference as well. It was a little more true to the film. Yeah. And people really enjoyed it. It got to number 13 in the charts over here. Yeah, the, the, the movie was certainly very gritty. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it, it definitely parts was. Of, parts of it that scared the shit out of me. I mean, it, was, it was good. I really I thoroughly... <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, last time we spoke, you were doing sponsorships of major gigs like Academy Awards and all sorts of stuff. So producing movies and being involved in movies, it's a hell of a long way to, from selling sponsorships, isn't it? So how did you get into that? You know, it sort of is, and it also coincides with it quite well. Um, just to segue into that, one of the parts of producing is putting together a team and the right money to make it a film yeah and sometimes that money comes from brand sponsorships you know in, in our movie it didn't it came from independent financing the one that you saw yeah um but many, many movies I, I helped another friend of mine uh, bring in certain brands to help finance his movie so the, the characters would drink a certain type of wine sure. in the movie and that that brand would pay for that placement and then even down to the, the premiere, you know, we had the premiere sponsored by a different brand so that we could afford to put it on. <laughs> so you saw that when you walk down the red carpet, you see the different brand logos behind. They were all companies that helped us in some way, shape or form to put that premiere on. And right. that, the 20 feet below, that was uh, Turkish Airlines. 
um, and Valkyrie Lounge, where we had the after party. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, that's that's kind of how it segued. But I've also, as you mentioned, done sponsorships for um, various events around the world, from events at Sundance Film Festival to yeah. the activation of the Cannes Film Festival, Comic Con, all those big events. Yeah, I can understand. I guess if you if you getting support for the Academy Awards, that would be a bloody sight easier than trying to get support for a, for a film, wouldn't it? Um, well, I've never actually got support for the actual Academy Awards. but oh, Well, I mean, you know, one of those yeah. type of events. Yeah, there's a lot of things that surround it. A couple of years ago, there was a film um, that actually won the Best Picture Oscar. And they they had a little idea that they might do quite well in the Oscars and wanted to run their own party. Yeah. Um, and that, that was at the 11th hour. They came to me on Thursday night before the Sunday Awards and said, Jeez. we need to raise this much money to have a party for our for our hopefully Oscar winning film. And that would have been and a heat. As it turned Yeah, that was the, the film The Artist, the black and white movie. Right. And as it was they did win. Um yeah, you're right. It's it's very easy to to raise that kind of money um from the right people if they understand the value of it. Yeah. But often you're not given much time and in this case it was two days to raise enough budget to throw a fabulous party in Sunset Strip. But the benefit was that all these A-list superstars were guaranteed to be there because yeah. of their contractual obligations with sure. the studio. So, so that really helps. The brands wanted to get their their uh, product or their brand associated with that kind of celebrity presence. There's kind of no better way to do it than that because you're in the right place at the right time. And a few of our our clients at night just wanted to be in the mix there and use it for a PR and marketing story rather than actually show off their brand there. How many people do it for ego? Um, I would say if you surveyed them, 20% would probably admit it. If you were being honest, I'd say 80 to 90% do it for ego. (laughs) Well, I've... I've been involved in a lot of sponsorships with sporting teams and I was involved with Formula One and I was involved, I was a part owner of a football team once and I would say that 99% of the people that got involved, whether they were the CEO of a company or the marketing director of a company or whether they were just some guy with too much money, did it for the ego. Yeah, but even with an ego um theme to it. I, I actually think that that can transcend into business because sure. if no, you're going no, no there question. because you, you want to yeah, you want to be in the right place at the right time with the right people, you, you may see that as ego on the outside, but actually once you get there, the, the quality of people in the room and the things that they are doing, one, one handshake that night yeah. can make the world of difference to sure. something because you're in a Absolutely. closed market of people. Um, and the other, you know, parts of that is that that ego, if you use it right in a PR sense, can translate very well into um, a lot of business or custom, depending on what you do. You know, if your product is in the the beauty and image realm, yep. there's nothing better than seeing the company CEO flaunting that stuff with A-list stars looking fabulous, right. because the customers want to see that, that that gives them the lifestyle that they want. They get the rub so off, yeah. There, there is a, exactly, yeah. So that's the concept of Sponsor Bridge, right? So the company's called Sponsor Bridge. One word, two words? Yeah, Sponsor Bridge, yeah. Sponsor Bridge. So w- why does it exist? I mean, you've been very successful over a whole range of things. You obviously love acting and, and, and um, directing. So why, do you, why, do you, why are you out there f- hawking sponsorship? <laughs> <laughs> Do you need the money, <laughs> mate? I can give you a loan. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of reasons, actually. For, firstly, I'm, I'm a bit of a shameless entrepreneur. I, you are. I can't, help, I can't help when I see an opportunity to jump yeah. on it. Yes. Um, but I'm also a big fan of automation and, and trying to find a business system to things. So ordinarily, if I look at something and it feels like it's a lot of work or outside of the realm of what I like to do, I won't touch it. But if I look at an opportunity and think there's a gap and that with a little bit of hard work, maybe a lot of hard work, but some sort of system and process that I can fill that gap or, or help that, that market do what it does, then I try to, to implement that and, and basically make it as passive as possible while still, you know, you have to work hard on it, but sure. making it as organized and formulative as possible. And the, 
sponsor bridge thing actually came out of charity. Um, I, as you mentioned in my bio, I was on the um, committee of Richard Branson's Rock the Casbar event when I came to LA. Yeah. Richard Branson's always been a, a huge hero of mine. And uh, I got the opportunity to be involved in a charity event, a big gala dinner that, that his charity was putting on. Yeah. And one of the, uh, one of the, the key jobs in being on that committee was raising money from either table sales and tickets or sponsorships or bringing in products so that we don't have to spend money on things right, like sure. wine and, and alcohol and things like that. Yeah. And I accidentally found that I was quite good at it. Um, and I think it's because I have a, a branding staffing company in the UK and US called StuckForStaff.com. Yeah, that's a great that, idea. Um, a, a data, thank you. Yeah, it's a database of promotional staff mm. that go out promoting all these different brands. So I think from that, I really understood what brands wanted out of an event or out of experiential marketing. So when I go and speak to them, I, I, I know what it is they're trying to achieve and I help them best achieve it through an event. And I think that's why I became good at the sponsorship stuff. Well, after I've, I've done a couple of those things, I'm also involved in Brit Week and the Bel Air Film Festival was one of, one of my little gigs for a while. Um, people started coming to me saying, hey, can you, can you do this for us, please? And I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not a sponsorship <laughs> guy. Um, but then they would ask me to do it and for, throw something interesting in front of my face, like either a nice commission or... <laughs> or um, T tickets to some of these great events, you know, and I, yeah. when I was new in LA, I, I got to go to Oscar parties and I got to go to Golden Globe award parties and things, which is great as a filmmaker and actor. So Fantastic. I started to think, well, hey, if I can put two people together, make some money and be in the right circle of people for my career, that can't Why be not? a bad thing. Yeah. And, and as time's gone on, I've also started to organize those events myself. So we did a big event at Cannes Film Festival last year uh, both for movie and a separate one for, for just different brands. Yep. And I do like a Comic Con, things like that. And it, it actually fosters some really great relationships uh, in the film community as well for me. So it kind of it cuts both ways on that. I, I have an event coming up at Sundance. We, we do a, a big roast dinner um, that I put on for uh, all of the British nominated filmmakers. Right. And that has made me some great relationships over the year. You know, we sit 250 people down. We feed them a four-course bill, and we mix all of the nominated filmmakers with investors and agents and distributors and lawyers and all the kind of people that they need to help their film succeed after the festival. And that's a great feeling, and it also makes money, so it, it's perfect. With great positioning for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when we had lunch, we were talking about um, a number of the um, entrepreneurial activities that you have on, and you are certainly busy and you, you you select the things that you do very well now how do you, how do you look to develop sponsor bridge where, where do you go from where you are it's been um, a bit of a, a long process at the moment because I'm trying to figure out um, how to automate it best um, so what we're looking at doing this year is is really honing down exactly that those formulas and automations that we can do while somehow respecting the fact that a sponsorship is a, is a big deal for a company and needs yeah. some hand-holding. Um, but going back to your ego point, um, and maybe your listeners will be interested in this part of things, the thing I found most interesting about this business is you can never seem to understand or know what ticks with a company. You yeah. can have a, a, an opportunity that is absolutely perfect for one brand, Yep. And a completely different brand is excited about it. Sure. And, you, you, you know, I had a, 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 the Emmys event recently. We had the regional Emmys competition. And we pitched this sponsorship to a tuxedo brand. Right. They were guys, guys that had an app that sends a tuxedo to your door. It was so perfect for them. It's unbelievable because all of these regional Emmy presenters were going to collect their awards. They could have their tux brand forever associated with the Emmys. Yep. And they didn't get it. And yet a completely different brand wanted to come in for this. And I almost wanted to say, hey, Chris, what, what is it that you see that you're going to get out of this? But they ended up getting a great PR story out of it because their CEO went along and met some great people. And, you know, and that, that stuff on their social media and in their office sparks conversations. And it was right for them because they knew what they wanted to achieve out of it. Yeah. Um, so 
going back to where to go with sponsor bridge, what I'm trying to do is is hone it down into into a systematic process which really helps people identify what they can get out of the sponsorship so that we target the right brands. Right. We we bring these great events to those brands and become synonymous with just quality events and opportunities where the brand can get their objective out of it. So what I'm going to focus on is bring, bringing more of those amazing you know, opportunities in. Uh, it's not about finding sponsorships for the local Kansas dog show. It's, yes. it's the real big sexy stuff. It's Oscar events, Golden Globe events, Sundance Film Festival, Monaco Grand Prix. And when I talk about those events, I don't just mean the main event. In each of those areas, there's three, four hundred major, amazing A-list celebrity events that go on around that. Yeah, you know, like yeah. For instance, com- coming up for the Golden Globes, we have an awards brunch with Nicole uh, with uh, Angelina Jolie. Right. It's a it's a very low key brunch, um, but it's brand sponsored. And a couple of years ago, the guys that I work with did it with Nicole, uh, Nicole Kidman, and it was amazing. They brought in all the gold medal Olympians. Yeah. Nicole Kim was there. That wasn't actually a Golden Globes Awards thing. It was the same weekend, but it had all the same star power. Yeah, yeah, I understand. You know, it's very difficult to anticipate what a company is likely to want to do, or, in fact, you know, one should never, ever assume that they understand the... um, the general public or or any segment of the market because you know quite often they have totally different views and often much for much more far reaching than 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 yours i think that's one of the things about sponsorships is is trying to actually articulate to people what they get out of it you know i was with involved with formula one and i remember knocking on a million doors trying to sell the sponsorship um the major sponsorship of a formula one and um Sure, it was bloody expensive, but at the same time, two billion people are watching it. But I went to boardroom after boardroom after boardroom after boardroom, and everybody sort of said, yeah, it's great, but and they went back to the money. Um, and we ended up selling to somebody that a government leaned on and made them buy it. Uh, so it's very difficult to articulate the benefits they can get out of it. And unfortunately, most marketing guys don't understand how they can leverage it. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think sometimes as well in larger companies, there's a bunch of people whose job it is to say no. Yeah. Um, They want to keep the status quo because if they make a a risk on a sponsorship and it goes badly, their job's on the line. But in addition to that, I I actually always tell this to any, any clients that I work with. Once you get the sponsorship opportunity paid for, Yep. And you get your the benefits, which is your logo on the red carpet and your tickets and your your you know name in the program or, or whatever it is. Yep. Whatever branding benefits you get, that's your jumping off point. It's yep. up to you as a brand then to make the noise about that. Your PR people yeah. should be should be going out saying, Hey, guess what? We are at the at the Golden Globes or we are at the Formula One. Your promotions they should be people looking should for be those, out there, yeah. Exactly, because a lot of people rely on the sponsorship to bring them everything, and it doesn't do that. You're you're putting your brand into a sponsorship so that that you can be part of that event and opportunity. But but always remember that the the people that are focused on that event are focused on their award ceremony or their sports game or whatever it is. Yes. Right? They they have teams in place to help you get the best out of it, but it's on you. And I've worked with people before where. I've come come out to them afterwards and I said, you just absolutely wasted that opportunity. You were stood there with Matthew McConaughey at the Golden Globes. Your brand was all over the place and I, I didn't see one social media post from you. You keep be drinking champagne. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me is a waste of opportunity. They need to get their own team on it as well. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of companies are guilty of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Driving that. So what type of companies does sponsorship really work for and and so, so does it work for everybody or does it work for certain segments of of the um commercial marketplace or what do you think i think it can work for all companies um depending on how you target it okay you've got you've got to be clear on your objectives right there's there's an objective for sales there's an objective for celebrity endorsement there's an objective for pr yep. there's an objective for news stories right yes. what firstly define your objective if you go to um, one of these celebrity gifting suites 
expecting your sales to rocket over the weekend, you're going to be disappointed, right? Yes. But if you go to a celebrity gifting tree, expecting to get 20 photos of mid-level celebrities holding your product, expecting a few of them to tweet about it, and then harness that to do your PR story saying, hey, look who uses that product and look who's happy with it, to your existing customers, and then get your PR team to go out to the magazines offering that information up, then you're going to have a great time. Yep. And then, then you're, then you're going to drive yourself. It's just, it depends what you're trying to achieve. So what I usually tell people is don't, don't get um, caught up in having your logo, for instance, on the back of the step and repeat red carpet where all the celebrities walk, unless you have an already recognizable logo, because very few people are going to actually yep. see that. If you think of the, the way it trickles down, yeah. Someone, someone has to, a news agency has to print that picture in a newspaper of that celebrity on that red carpet. And someone's got to see your brand, look your brand up, care enough to buy a product. Right? That's a long process. Yep. Where if you've got a brand like Coca-Cola or, or a big, big name brand, then every brand impression counts. And, and having that brand alignment with celebrity counts. Yep. So if you've got an emerging brand, I think you're better to go in at grassroots and do some of these things like celebrity gifting lounges or do a smaller sponsorship at a bigger event to wet your feet to see how it works and work with, with someone. Um, I'll give you an example. We, uh, we're working with a, a very quality but emerging glove designer right. uh, called Paula, Paula Rowan Gloves in Dublin. Right. She's come on board for our Sundance event. Uh, we're doing a big uh, dinner, as I said, at Sundance for the British nominated filmmakers in association yep. with a company called Chef Dance. So we bring in a celebrity chef, we cook these amazing meals and wine pairings. Now, Paula's gloves are these gorgeous leather gloves. So what we decided with her was that she was going to produce custom made gloves with a small British flag on it to represent the FN right. with our, our event name on the inside. Okay. And these gloves are going to operate as the exclusive ticket to the event. Cool. Now, Sundance is, is in a very cold ski town. Right. Okay, so very cool. Everyone's going to have to. Everyone's going to have to come and tick their name off the guest list in the middle of the day, to, and they'll get these gloves. And I believe we're also putting some of Richard E. Grant's new scent in it called Jack. Right. And they'll get these gloves, and they have to wear these gloves to the event that evening. That's, that is a that's how they get. That access. is a bloody so, good idea. <laughs> that is a really Thank good you. idea. Very cool. Um, so, so if it works, it yeah, I'm sure work. that'll Paula work. Rowan that's really, does. that's really very yeah. cool. So your um, and that's what we did for her. Your major advice then to um, to companies that are seek that buy sponsorships is to use the event simply as the platform and then leverage the hell out of it to get the benefits of the sponsorship. Absolutely. Right. It, it, it's, it's the best thing you can do. You've got to see it as the start. Because it, if you just give the money over and you expect the event, like, let's take something like well, yeah, uh, the Golden Globe Awards, right? The right. Chrysler sponsored it last year. Now, yes, they'll say the Chrysler, the Golden Globe Awards, or whatever it is, but Chrysler also had their car there. They were doing photo opportunities. They were doing all these different things because you have to then really honing your brand because at the end of the day, everyone's watching the Golden Globe Awards. Yeah. The general public aren't watching the cries to go Golden Globe Awards. No, true. So there's some, sub, there's some subliminal brand impressions there, but it's just a seed. But it's a very, very good seed for you to make a lot of your own noise about. And that's what, what I think is the point. So apart from, apart from people not leveraging the event well enough what other common mistakes do businesses make when um, they're sponsoring events um that's the main one but i would say either spending too much money or spending too little money um so going for the wrong package for what they're trying to achieve really uh, you know it's it's uh, Oh, and, and I'll tell you another one from, from the point of view of, of being someone that, that knows all the different opportunities. Yeah. It's choosing, the, it's believing hype and not doing the research. It's very easy to make a nice PowerPoint presentation about an event and make it look very glamorous. Right? Sure. Every major event around the world, whether it's the Grand Prix or the, the Oscars, 
have a bunch of satellite events that happen in around the area and around the time. Some of them are fantastic, some of them aren't. It's the simple way to put it. So you want to make sure that if there's an event that's happening Oscar weekend, is it that the people have invited Leonardo DiCaprio or has Leonardo DiCaprio confirmed or has Leonardo DiCaprio contracted to host it? They're all different things and they all look the same to yeah. the naked eye on a, on a presentation. Going back to that the Golden Globes thing, um, the brunch we had with Nicole Kidman, Nicole Kidman was the host of it. Right. Tom Bon Jovi was the host of it. The, the Olympiads were the honorees. So you were darn sure that they were going to be there. Yeah. Okay. But there'll be another event happening two doors down that says, yeah, we'll, we'll be filling it with A-list stars and the best thing that happens is a, 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 a former TV star shows up. And then that leaves the brand disappointed. Now, those events can often be the same amount of money because the person running the event is, is thinking what they want in terms of cash for it sure. rather than what, it, what it's worth. What it's so worth, yeah. you do have to be careful. And that's one of the things we're doing with Sponsor Bridging in the year is, is making sure, you know, I've, I've only ever done those kind of events, but I've realized that it, living in LA for the time that I have and being involved in all those world events at ground level, you know, I, I've been to Cannes 10 times, I've been to Sundar 10 times. I can look at an invitation and know what type of event it is. I know from the people running it, I know from the way it's laid out, I know from the venue they're using, whether it can be good and bad. You know, our Sundance event is right bang in the middle of Main Street. If you want to hit the, 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 the 200,000 people that attend Sundance, you can't be out in some mansion somewhere seven miles away unless right. you've got huge star, star power yeah so so that makes a difference so if i if i'm out there i'm listening to the show and i'm thinking gee i wouldn't mind getting involved in some of these big events um if they go to sponsor bridge which is just as it sounds s-p-o-n-s-o-r-b-r-i-d-g-e you will say to them these are all the opportunities that are available and this one works for you and this one doesn't irrespective of trying to empty their pockets. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm very, very clear on is, is that I, I will give the opportunities over and I'll, I'll help people decide what's best for them because we have a whole array of them, yeah. And the Sponsor Bridge website is being read out right now, but um, we, we do have a Twitter handle, at Sponsor Bridge, and then there's also a Facebook group, Sponsor Bridge as well, where um, you'll see opportunities coming through from us, but also other people are allowed to post their opportunities or their requests to get involved in things, you know, we can, brands can come there and say, hey, I want to do something, what shall I do? And that's the other thing I'm very good at. If a brand comes to me and says, you know, I, I want to do some activity, I'm not sure, you know, what kind of thing to do, just tell me your objectives. Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it celebrity endorsement? And I'll come back to you with, uh, uh, or one of my team will, with a bunch of, of different ideas and opportunities that we think fits what you're trying to do. Um, and fits the budget that you're, you're, you're willing to spend, you know. And we, we had a, a great one last year, which was, um, it's, it's called the Perlan Project. It's a, a, a mission to near space, to the edge of space in a, an unpowered glider. Right. Now, that's not for everyone. Um, you know, it's a huge scientific and aeronautical project. But Airbus came on board with that. And they're, they're now our major sponsor. And there's other sponsorships available for that. Um, and, you know, that's been, been run in conjunction with Orange PR out of Spain. And those kind of sponsors now, a brand like Airbus is there. Big, big brands can get involved and leverage not only the, the Airbus name, the Perlan name, this amazing science mission, um, whereas a brand that's just emerging, that wouldn't be right for. You know, they're, they're not yeah, going to get no, the level of exposure they need. But if they come to me and say, hey, we've only got $10,000, I'll say, right, let's go to some of these maybe gift lounges in, in Los Angeles. Let's do a little sponsorship in the Cannes Film Festival if you're, if you're trying to sell to that kind of market. And, and they'll find them the, t- the, the things that fit their budget and their needs. Okay, mate. Well, Darren, I know you're in London and you're spending Christmas with the family. I wish you all the best for Christmas. And thanks very much for all the terrific work you do. And I can tell you that I know the guy quite well, and he is very genuine, straight up and down. So if you'd like to know more about Darren, go to darrend.co.uk.com. So I'll do that again, darrend.com.uk. 
dot, I'll do it again. No, dot co, dot co, yeah. UK, Bob. Darren, D, dot co, dot UK. Um, yes. <laughs> so this is Bob Pritchard. You're listening to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show on Voice America Business, and I'll be back with you in just a moment. Do you want your business to achieve results you never thought possible? Bob Pritchard is recognized as the business leader's advisor and has 30 years of experience as a straight-talking troubleshooter for Fortune 500 companies and SMEs across the world. Whether you need a checkup across all departments of your business or simply want to improve marketing, advertising, performance measurement, or some other area, Bob Pritchard will work his magic so you can blow away your competition. Bob Pritchard is also one of the most in-demand speakers in the world. Over 1,500 clients on five continents and countless standing ovations are a testament to how he changes the fortunes of business. Pick up Bob's new book, Kick-Ass Business and Marketing Secrets, at your nearest bookstore or visit Bob's website at www.bobpritchard.com. Remember, if you want to be successful, call Bob Pritchard now. Worldwide phone numbers and more information can be found at bobpritchard.com. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. To connect with Bob, please send an email to bob at bobpritchard.com. That's bob at bobpritchard.com. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the first Bob Pritchard, straight talking, absolutely no bullshit on this program. This is a business show, and it's the first one for 2015, and we're coming to you from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Now, I hope you had a fantastic New Year's Eve. Mine was great, and uh, and if you're just returning to work, probably yesterday, please remember... Bite off more than you can chew in 2015. Just bite off as much as you can and then chew like hell. You always get much further when you aim much higher. And most importantly, enjoy yourself. Have fun. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, give it the flick. Now, this is the segment of the show where we uh, bring you emails from our listeners all around the world. And as, as I've mentioned before, it doesn't matter where I'm giving speeches, whether I'm in Moscow or Sydney or Los Angeles or Sao Paulo. In question time, you get exactly the same questions because businesses all over the world, no matter what they do or where they are or what system of government they operate under, they all have the same issues. So the um, segments that I cover in this um, segment is uh, – Applicable to every, anybody everywhere in the world. The first email today comes from Lana Grimm of West Palm Beach, Florida. And Lana writes, Dear Bob, thanks for a great show. I've learned a lot that has helped me with my business. My question is probably one that many others have, but how can I get all of my employees to really care about the business? How can I get them to try to improve productivity and, and give their all? I mean, some work harder than others, but I, I just have the feeling that all of them could give a lot more. Well, Lana, I, I believe the key is to pay everybody a base salary and award salary increases and bonuses and promotion um, based on performance. Put everyone on incentives. The most successful businesses are those with high-performing employees and the biggest single impediment to high performance is the lack of accountability for their results. So you've got to give all your employees objective, quantifiable goals which define the results they're expected to achieve. They are then each evaluated against accomplishing those goals within a formal written evaluation process. And Lana, I've no doubt that if you do this, you'll find that personal initiative and productivity will increase significantly. Lana, I hope that's a help to you. If you include all of these elements in uh, everything, you'll notice a big improvement in productivity. Tomorrow, we'll send you out a copy of Kick-Ass Business and Marketing Secrets, How to Blitz Your Competition, which is my latest book, and I'm sure it will be a big help with your business. That's all I've got time for today because of the um, great interview with Darren. 
So if you're a regular listener to the show and are benefiting from the advice that my guests and I give you each week, please tell your friends to listen. Go to my website at bobpritchard.com and subscribe to my monthly newsletter going out just in a few days. Um, We hope that you had a fantastic New Year's Eve and have settled back into work. We're confident this is going to be a fantastic year for everyone in business, the perfect time to commence your entrepreneurial endeavours. We look forward to having your company throughout the year on the Bob Pritchard Business Radio Show. Now, thanks for listening. And uh, remember, if you're serious about being successful, this is the place to come at the same time every week. This is Bob Pritchard. I hope you have a great week and a very successful year. You've been listening to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. Please join us again next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. Until then, enjoy another week of success in your business and your life.